All right, so with these native plants, what do we do with them, right? I mean, we want to incorporate them into everything, but in terms of sustainable landscapes, um, what's now becoming more popular are these various green infrastructure, stormwater BMPs, <laughs> at, at all different scales. And it's important to remember when we're talking about a stormwater BMP, it's not necessarily a constructed element in the landscape. It can be a strategy in your design process, and it can be a strategy in a construction process as, as much as it is a tangible rain garden or uh, bioretention facility. Okay, so we're gonna go over some actual uh, you know, constructed stormwater BMPs, and we're gonna talk about some more site management type BMPs that can be used not only for stormwater management, but for sustainable, sustainability. All right, so the first one protects sensitive natural resources. Anyone familiar with MPDS knows we got to map sensitive natural resources. Okay, so this should be something that as designers and as contractors, we just do it. Not because MPDS says we have to do it, because it's the right thing to do. Okay, so that means keep your LOD tight, right? Don't, the, the area within the LOD is the permitted area that you can disturb, but if you can avoid disturbing areas, avoid disturbing areas. Right? Every time we disturb something, we mess up the soil structure. We mess up the biological processes that are happening in the soil. We, we create compactions, we eliminate infiltration. Less infiltration means more runoff. Where's the runoff going? It's going downhill. Eventually downhill leads to some sort of water body. Okay, so so trying to be mindful when we're planning out, you know, how we're going to disturb the site, where we're going to, you know, run equipment is something we should always be thinking about at every stage in the game. Not just I'm going to slot my LED on the plan and I'll let the contractor worry about it. It's something you should preach to the contractor. Okay. It's, you have to find a balance, obviously, because they need to achieve certain goals, but it should be something that should be considered. Uh, reducing the use of chemicals. We spray. We have to. Like I just said, mugwort crown vetch. If we can use string trimming, if we can use mowing, that's what we do. But inevitably, we just have to. Okay? There's, there are, I, I don't know how many different mixtures of, of organic uh, weed killers I've seen out there. For the work we do, it's not practical to buy 25 gallons of vinegar. Okay? But you know, if you have a client that's interested in that and they want to reduce chemicals, you know, we're all for it. And we've had the conversation with clients, look, we can't, we can't do the method you want us to do, but we will do our best version of that. You know, it's kind of the conversation that we have. And if, you know, my, my first, in a meadow site, in any sort of BMP, my first inclination is let's mow it or string trim it and try to manage it that way. Okay? I, I use the herbicide and the chemical use and I just keep it in my back pocket and if I have to use it, that's what I do. So that's, like, that's a method we sort of use to, to reduce our chemical use. Fertilizers will fall in there too. If you're using native plants, hopefully you don't need fertilizers. Right? So, uh, you know, again, it's these are these are kind of strategies that that we'll call them BMPs. I mean, they are BMPs, but but they're on the planning side of things. Steep slopes, wetlands, sensitive resources. I mean, I you know, I don't think anyone here is looking to bulldoze wetlands, but you'd be surprised when I mean, we have to point it out. Steep slopes, if it's vegetated and it's steep, I don't mess with it because. I don't know how I'm going to get it revegetated. I'm sure I can get it revegetated, but who knows how much erosion is going to occur by the time I get it vegetated. So if I can avoid it, I just avoid it. Stay away from it. We have clients that say we have this steep slope. Uh, can you do something with it? I can do something with it, but why would you? You know, It's not a problem for you now. You want to make it look better? Yeah, we'll try to figure out how to make it look better. But, you know, you can keep people to leave steep slopes as they are. If they're in a vegetated, stable condition, why wouldn't you? I mean, those are tough, tough environments to establish any sort of vegetation on. Andy, you can 
Yes. Uh, do you guys provide any uh, like training seminars? Like, if I would introduce you to our DPW, we're trying to work with. You know, do you guys? Could we hire you guys to come in and train the DPW to know the difference, basic differences between landscape material and weeds? You know, because to them it's all the same. And we just had a big project where beautiful project in the fall, we're back in the spring, and we have a new mayor and a new DPW, new people. They sprayed all of the ground cover, you know, with Roundup, and they weed whacked half of the native species, you know. It wasn't too bad, but it, it was, from a designer standpoint, it was, you know, ridiculous, but yeah, we, a little bit of education goes a long way. Yeah, we, we do do that, and, and that actually, if you can hold on to that, that'll tie into the construction maintenance and monitoring section at the end of the day. And I think I can shed more light on that process and how we've assisted some of our clients with that exact thing, education. And not just, we're gonna come out and we're gonna charge you a bunch of money. We actually, we need to develop a plan to help you understand how to manage what you have and eventually phase land studies out. You know, we're, I mean, we're, we're education first. We're the front line. Everyone here is the front line. So we need to think about education. The other thing that's, that's really important related to maintenance like that is um, hands-on working together with them. So we've developed in, in some relationships with municipalities where our maintenance guys will, will do the maintenance for the first year and then work with their maintenance group at the same time. So they're working with us and getting trained in the field hands on. Um, a lot of better results with that than handing them a guide and saying, here's how often we can mow, here's what we need to do. That way they see what the issues are and they experience it and they, they, the training works much better. And it's, then it can be passed off a lot easier. So we'll talk about some of that later. The next one's protecting natural surface drainage features. Uh, this is also a siting thing. We recently worked with a program that basically cost shared the expense of installing stormwater BMPs in residential neighborhoods. And one of the requirements of being eligible for those funds was that they had to have a design professional come out and look at their property. And what they wanted to avoid was this kind of these kind of siting issues that would result in just having people that didn't have a design background wanting to install stormwater BMP. And a perfect example of this is one of the first ones, the assessments I ever did, I walked down and home, this homeowner was like, I have stormwater issues. Just it's, all this stormwater comes down the hill on the road, runs across my yard and washes out, washes out my yard. I want to put a rain guard right here. And they pointed to the upslope, the most upslope corner of their yard. And I was like, in the nicest way possible, that doesn't make any sense. You know, you might as well put it at the bottom end. You know, I mean, this is probably to everyone here, it makes perfect sense. But there are times when we need to think about where's the water going and how can we put our BMPs in the natural drainage ways, along the natural drainage ways because what we can do is we can reduce our impacts on the site because we're already taking advantage of existing features that are getting at the water where it goes. It's not gonna work every time, but it's something to be aware of as we're planning the BMPs on our sites. If I already have a swale in place, a natural swale in place, why build a new one if I don't have to? Maybe I have to, you know, maybe stormwater calculations, you run those and you figure out you do. But if you don't, leave it be, put your BMP down at the bottom, and half your work's done. Half your work's done. Okay? Disconnecting impervious surfaces from storm sewers. This is becoming really big, we're finding. I don't know about this region, but in Lancaster City, this is becoming just huge. You know, the rain barrel craze is, is just exploded. But for good reason, you know, they're saying all these downspouts discharge, you know, they come out of the curb, they discharge on the road, they go straight into the storm sewer, and then they discharge into the Conestoga River down in Arctic. Okay, how can we disconnect those? 
And it seems like a little, simple, tiny thing. But, you know, you take 15 houses, what if you can disconnect all the downspouts? 15 houses, that roof area, as much, collecting as much storm water as you can in some sort of BMP or rain barrel for either later use or infiltration on site. Those numbers start to add up. So it, it seems little, but in, you know, when you start really sort of expanding that and, and, and moving out with everybody doing the same practice, the benefits get larger and larger and larger and larger. Um, I think with this, it's important to note, when we're talking about some of these practices, we're talking small scale. We're not talking about stormwater control devices, necessarily. We're talking about um, ways to help manage stormwater, but I'm not going to install a rain garden and it's expected to do the job of a detention basin. Okay, rain garden, and we'll get to it. Uh, maybe next. No. Who, who manages the barrels? Would it be the property owner himself, or yeah. does somebody come around and? It depends where it is. I mean, uh, most you know. I know a lot of townships do programs, rain barrel programs. You're you live in the township, you come out, you get a rain barrel. They'll they'll show you how to put it in, and you go home and you install it. It fills up. You water your flowers. The homeowner takes care of it. Uh, I would think if you know the township started putting them in. If the township required them being installed, maybe they would take care of it. I, my guess is it would vary. But the good thing about them is they're low maintenance. Oh, yeah, no, I use a system like that. Yeah. So, again, it's, you know, it's another planning tool. It seems small, but if everybody starts doing it, disconnecting their downspouts, disconnecting impervious from um, storm sewer systems, there's benefit really kind of grows exponentially. And it works better in areas where people are paying for water? Right. Yeah. Oh. yeah. If, if you've got 50, 100 gallons of water out of your water in your garden in the city, and it all adds up. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, an inch of rain on a roof, it's a lot of rain. It's a lot of water. Check and establish repairing buffers. Again, sometimes we're required to do this through permitting practices, but in general, it's just a good practice. If you're if you're doing a design at a site and there's a 50 foot buffer and there's an opportunity to make it 100 feet, you might as well do it. Obviously, the client has to be willing, you know, because they're going to need to pay for it. But there are advantages, significant environmental advantages to planning and repairing buffers. It doesn't have to be forested. You know, the picture we have here, you've got a filter strip and then you've got a forested repairing buffer. If, if they want a meadow, they really want to see a meadow, put a meadow in. Grass repairing buffer is better than no repairing buffer. Um, the forested repairing buffers, I think, are especially relevant in this area because we don't really have grass prairies as a naturally occurring ecosystem. It's mostly forested. And you know, the shading of the streams and with stream bank erosion being such an issue, I think trees and shrubs are kind of the natural uh, way that people want to stabilize those things. But you need these different layers and grass and herbaceous layers is one of the first layers you need to establish when you're establishing a repairing buffer. These things have direct benefits to water quality, direct. And, and, and when we're just, you know, hopefully we're disconnecting the stormwater, but anything that doesn't get disconnected or flows downhill, eventually it's going to hit a stream. And if you can go through a repairing buffer first, you get all those, those water quality benefits from the filtering that the plants have, pulling out any sort of pollutants, sediment's going to drop out if it has to go through some kind of vegetative strip. And even if it's small, it's more than what turf grass is going to provide. Bioretention. Bioretention is a catch-all. Um, you know, we generally sort of, any sort of rain garden, bioswale, any of those small systems, all the way up to a full-blown retrofitted basin are going to fall under bioretention. It's, you know, it's a generic term. Uh, filtration benefits because you're planting native stuff in there, you're planting plants that are going to have deeper root systems, 
every time you cut grass, the root system gets shorter. So if you let grass go, the root system's gonna increase. The problem is, an eight inch tall turf grass is only gonna have a root system that's you know eight inches or 12 inches. Whereas if you've got some of those native grasses, native sedges, you're gonna have root systems that could be four feet, five feet underground. Roots, they do, you know, they break up soil compaction. They help keep the soil open. Uh, they draw moisture out of the soil. So you get the filtration benefits of, for water quality. So when we're talking about bioretention, all of, the, all of these benefits that are listed here remain the same across the board. It's just what level of benefit do you get based on the size of the facility. So starting down at the bottom is the rain garden. This is like, these things are called on like wild flock fire. Um, these are great for residential sites and for small sites where you might want to develop some kind of decentralized stormwater control system. We're, do, we're working on some park renovations uh, out in the Philly area right now and we're installing four rain gardens and six bioswifts. And the whole point is, look, instead of managing our MPDS requirements and our township requirements in a big basin and losing all this park space, we're just going to decentralize it and connect all these rain gardens together. And it spreads it out. We're going to plant flowers regardless of whether or not we have these things. So why not install rain gardens? They can double as flower beds and stormwater facilities. The other thing, great thing is they're so shallow. This doesn't require a chain link fence. Right. You know, we saw some examples yesterday where you have six foot high, ugly chain link fence around the facility that's dangerous. Right. You know, so it's a major liability, decentralized, and reduce your liability on. Cycle. Yeah, and, and, it, drown in this. and with that, when we're designing these, we want to, you know, six, eight inches depth max. Other than you start running the risk for ponding, and as soon as you have ponding water, they're going to be calling you about mosquitoes. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, 10% uh, clay content, so you want to add soil amendments to your existing topsoil to cut that clay percentage down to 10% or less. There's a lot, we have seen a lot of different details and, and you know whether you're adding sand there's benefits to adding sand we generally stay away from it at this size project because it adds a lot of cost I know that if I take soil samples I can usually add some kind of leaf compost to the soil to get my clay fraction low enough that I'll have infiltration because it, at the residential at a residential site on a small site like a park where people are going to be there all the time if you've got standing water you're going to know about it hurt so they're going to be all over the township, and the township's coming right to you, or the homeowner's coming right to you. And then on top of that, you've got a layer of native plants, whether it's mulched or seeded. It's up to you. Again, design goals. Where are the goals of the project? Um, if you're going to mulch it, you want to use hardwood mulch so it doesn't float out. And then, you know, the budget for planting varies. If, I can pa if someone wants a mulched rain garden and I can pack it with uh, like plugs and then supplement with flowering herbaceous things that's what I'll do and just try to create this like mat of sedges and rushes and then have add my color through my wildflowers that's what I'll do um, but a seed mix works and, and you know and if you want to plant shrubs in there I mean again project goals. but most native plants I mean we uh, native plants go nuts in these kind of things uh, I mean anything will go nuts good organic soil but We've had a lot of luck with wetland plants, and that's a whole other component. You can you can introduce all these wet, typical wetland species into a site that's not a wetland. You can take a generally upland site, put in some stormwater BMPs, and create a you know quote unquote wetland complex in a small stormwater BMP. And with MS4, as education is becoming more and more a critical component, it, this is just another avenue. Stormwater control, education for MS4. You know, really the sky's the limit for these types of things and they're inexpensive. They're very inexpensive to construct. I think um, one point about the soil material and uh, there's some research that Bartlett Tree Company has been doing down in North Carolina and uh, probably the most extensive that I've seen and others may know of some better uh, examples but pretty much an unbiased uh, approach to researching different soil mixes for rain gardens and um, also
also looking at some of the new materials that are coming out of them. We've heard of biochar. Um, it's kind of a new additive that, that they're looking at to keep the porosity of these green, you know, green garden soil um, you know, more open and, and so on. So they've been doing a lot of research. I would I would use that, take a look at, you know, if you just uh, Google uh, Bartlett Tree Company and Green Garden Soil Research or something like that, uh, you can find out that they've been doing a lot of really, really good stuff and they're interested in the long-term sustainability of this with demonstration plots. I think for those of you who are here on, on Tuesday and heard uh, Tom and Cecilia talk about bioretention, they, they talked a lot about the soils as well. And um, from the from the urban stormwater group, they're they're looking for a higher sand um, uh, content, and some of that is for bigger bigger sites. Uh, but the big thing is really keep that clay down. These things are designed to drain. Um, that's a big thing, as Andy said. If you have standing water, then it's, it's really not functioning as it should be. One of the things that we saw at Bartlett, they did a lot of research with the um, uh, CU soils, with the uh, engineered soils, and they had these plots that have been in the ground for up to 10 years um, to show the difference in how the trees have responded to probably 20 different uh, CU type soil mixes. And uh, they did the same for rain gardens. But they were finding in the end that their, some of their, their test plots that were just, you know, just good topsoil were just as effective as some of these other really fancy mixes. So um, again, I thought, I thought it was really interesting that they were looking at kind of this more long-term sustainability and kind of more of an unbiased approach to their research um, overall. So it's kind of a nice overall long-term So, and again, the, the, the planting soil for these things, you know, every company's probably going to have their preference on how they do it. Our preference at this size is, is not to use any sort of infrastructure, so we don't use pipes at this size, and, and try to maintain some semblance of what the existing soils are. That's why we use leaf compost as opposed to sand. Um, but, critical thing, like Drew said, less than 10%, you can approach it with however you want. I will say that as you increase the sand percentage, you need to be aware of what you're planting in those things. Because, you know, we looked at the Viburnum dentatum, that's a coastal plain species, probably not going to mine some sandy soil. But we have some other tree species and shrub species that are used to growing in Piedmont, in Pennsylvania, and it's going to be they're going to like a little more clay. They're going to like heavier soil. So you need to think about if I'm changing the soil composition, how does that impact other things in the design? Um, also included with the rain gardens, I would sort of say bioswales are in that same vein. Only difference is you're not retaining water to advance twice. But I would generally, we plant them generally the same way as rain gardens. We treat the soil amendments the same way as rain gardens. You do get some infiltration if you've got your soils appropriately um, put together, you just won't get as much because you're not stopping the water, it's just, again, it's a conveyance device. Uh, constructed wetlands, this one is, is a great system to use if you've got to collect a lot of water and after you do your infiltration testing, you get the big goose egg out of sight because you're, you're not so much concerned with infiltrating the water you're just you're just going to collect it there now the other thing you have to keep in mind is the client your clients gonna have to be okay with that standing water is like you need to find the right person for that application but it, but it's an excellent way I mean it, it, it creates a whole new ecosystem on a site and it creates a whole new opportunity for education if you have an opportunity to put in a creative wetland not only can you mimic the same types of plant communities that you're putting in, say, a rain garden, but if you've got ponding water, you can introduce emergent species. And a lot of people don't realize how many emergent species there are. A lot of people don't realize iris, which, for the most part, most clients love to see iris. Purple flowers in May, oh my gosh, great. That's, a, that's an emergent species. 
people don't realize it because in cultivation we water so much that that you know the iris can pretty much grow wherever. But iris is is a obligate wetland species. So you can introduce these different plant species that a lot of people have never seen before, and it really allows your project, a project like this, to take on a life of its own because it, I mean it's a difference maker. It looks different, the plant material is different. It's just it's unique in its own right, and you still get all the water quality benefits because the water, the plants are pull, sucking up water, they're pulling out nutrients, sediments dropping out in the wetland system. So when the site conditions are right, you know this and and the goals of the project obviously allow for it. This is a this is a pretty interesting and a pretty neat uh, stormwater BMP to implement. This is a site right down the street from our office. Uh, catches a lot of stormwater runoff from a relatively uh, busy road. And uh, it's, you know, you can see there's water in it now. It's pretty much always full of water. And, and to my knowledge, even with all of the West Nile stuff going on west of us in the Harrisburg area, I, I don't know that this really drew any sort of special attention. And, and it's really, you don't have to worry about it. If you build these things right, and there's biological activity, and there's dragonflies flying around, and there's, you, you know, they're gonna eat mosquito larvae, frogs, and bats. So again, education. You know, you put a pile of tires there and fill them with water. Okay, yeah, you're probably going to have some what's not on the but potentially, say potentially. And then the detention basin retrofits, and this is, you know, bioretention at its highest level. If you have an opportunity, you have to put in a, a detention basin. You don't have any other option. That's fine. I mean. You know, we're not calling for never using detention basins again, but when we put them in, let's get let, let's make them a value to the site and not just a big wide open area of turf that nobody can really go in because it's usually too wet or whatever. Uh, this is township building. We seeded it and then it was planted by uh, volunteers for an Eagle project. And they, they just manage it as a meadow. I think they maybe mow it once or twice a year. And off to, to the, your, the left of the picture, you can't see it, forest, concrete, walking trail. So it, it's a feature in this, in this township's park as much as anything. It had to be put there. You know, they were obligated to install this thing because they did an expansion and regulation required that they put it in. And he said, well, if we're going to put this thing in, we're going to make it an asset. We're not just going to make it something we have to do. So it's full of uh, all different native species, plant trees around it. And because the detention basin is going to have these different you know, undulations in the, in the topography in the bottom, you've got sections where there's bulrushes growing four or five feet tall. And then you've got other sections where you've got more upland species growing. But that was planned for. When we planned to plant this, we knew that there were going to be variations in hydrology, both because it's going to be wet and then it's going to be dry, but we knew eventually this thing would sort of settle itself out. You were going to have some wet pockets and you're going to have some very dry pockets. So the challenge with these is usually not so much getting people on board, because generally people are always on board with something that's going to make a site look good. It, it's planning for the potential changes in planting conditions and how do we plant this thing to look good and still, you know, meet the goals of the project. I, I always come back to the goals of the project because that's like what it's all about. Um, so this, I mean, today this has been a really successful example of, of, a, of a detention basin retrofit. This was a retrofit. The other option is you just right from the jump, you spec a seed mix. Or, or some sort of planting method, and after they take it out of BNS, put the topsoil back in, seed it, plant it, uh, whatever. With retrofits, something you got to be mindful of if you're planning a retrofit is your clay liner. Sometimes you're required, you know, we're, we're karst area, so sometimes we have to put clay liners in there. Uh, you don't want to plant trees and shrubs and those, pretty much want to stick to the herbaceous things, uh, but you got to do some homework before you just start planting in a retrofit situation, but, um, you know, there's really, I can't really think of any negatives to, to why you wouldn't want to retrofit one of these or just right from the jump, 
plan for it to be a naturalized area. And you own those lines. But I was wondering at exact point, like in Lancaster County, we have so many sinkhole, Chester County, so many sinkhole prone areas that we have to play line a lot of spaces. But when you go to do a project like this, a retrofit, do you typically have to go back to the original engineering firm that designed that basin and sealed it? Or how do you, what's the process of retrofitting, like design wise? Uh, so some revisiting you have to do, or? Yeah. That work? Usually for us, it's just a matter of getting a hold of the land development plans or whatever you know the permit drawings were. Understand how this thing was constructed, and then we can sort of understand what our options are in terms of the retrofit. So the the church that Kelly showed you with the rock amphitheater that looks out on an enormous. I think it's like a one acre basin that there was no clay liner, so we planted a couple trees, but we mostly just seeded it. But the berms had clay cores in it, so we had to stay off of the berms with any kind of woody material. So that's what we did. And we didn't do the land development. We just said, look, we're going to help you out with this, but here's what we need from you. We need you to get the land development plans. We need to understand what we're planting into to make sure that we don't impact the function. We're just trying to improve the aesthetics. Yeah. Have you had any trouble with salt tolerance on rain garden type plantings and around roads and uh, parking lots? We haven't had problems until like the last two winters. And we just, I just took soil samples at the site that we planted the, the meadow that was kind of originally overrun with invasives because we had huge dieback in the rain gardens. We didn't install the rain gardens. We, we retrofitted, we planted them essentially, and we added some native vegetation. But the first year we planted them, it looked great. Second year, they looked pretty good. We had some dieback. And then this year, they just got decimated. And we took soil samples. I haven't gotten them back yet, so I don't know what it's going to say in terms of soluble salts. But my feeling is that that's probably what contributed to it. The other thing that could contribute to it is. Where are they storing snow? And this is a you know this is a maintenance conversation, again. But you know we're clear when we put these rain gardens in; these aren't snow storage facilities. You know you can't do that because you think about it. They put salt down, then it snows again. They come, they plow it all up, they dump it in the rain garden. Where's all the snow? Where's all the salt? Going? So you're getting these concentrated sort of levels, and I, and I can see it in early spring at all of our rain gardens if people are doing that there's a ring of salt around the bottom after the snow melted filled up a little bit all of the all of the you know rock salt or whatever they use cinders kind of floated and moved out to the edges of the, of the rain garden i can see it so we clean them out and, and i think i think we haven't come up with we haven't come up with a method for working around that yet because it's it's been basically a new issue to us. But my guess is you would want to start thinking in terms of what are more coastal plain species that might experience a salt, a saltier, a higher salt content in the soil or even in the air. It's so like prairie cord grass is something, or just cord grass, salt cord grass is something that might be an option. I know they're, they're doing that more in Lancaster City now because they've had yeah, uh, die back the same thing and they're doing the, the port grass. Well, Ernest has some coastal seed mixes and things too. And I was just wondering whether that might be a better thing. To do. Yeah, and you have been specifically salt tolerance. Yeah. In, and and the what they handed out the landscape plug manual. There's they know more salt tolerant species. Okay. So that's. I would say if, if you're having that issue, I would start leaning in that direction. Maybe we need to start introducing some salt tolerant species. It's really only, we have one rain garden that we put in that collects water from an alley and a roof and they fill it up with snow every year and it's been like, I think this is the third or fourth year since it's been installed and the plants look great. Then we have another site down in the Philly area where they just got pounded. I think it was either because of the snow or because of the salt or both. I don't know. It could be too what they're putting down. They smell is completely different from you know salt. some of the other. Uh, 
materials that they use. Well, one of the things I find that the heaviest users of salt are the uh, workplaces, uh, industrial yeah. type of things, because they have their highest percentage of the work that's compact. Yeah, they don't, don't want anybody falling. Parking lot. So they yeah. tend to use a lot more. Yeah, and the site where we're having the issues with the salt's hospital. And I'm sure there's no coincidence there. But it, uh, they're working with their contractors. Even they re recognize, look, that was way too much. I was out in April, and there was still salt laying on the sidewalks. And the, some of the concrete sidewalks had started spalding. And that was a new issue. They didn't have that issue in the fall. So again, it's, it's education. You know, and I don't think, you're never going to stand between someone and potential lawsuit. They're going to do what they do. The best you can say is, look, don't use more salt than you have to, and try not to store snow and stockpile snow in these things. Yeah. Which is tough on tight earth. Right. And you can't, because right. you can't say you can't. I mean, I want to say you can't, but it, it does, I, I'm not there every time they do snow removal. So I, I also chain myself to the thing. You know, how am I? One of the approaches, one of the watershed groups we're working with is uh, their boroughs um, are we kind of working with them to develop a, a guideline for salt and snow removal. Um, I figured there'd be a lot of research out there on that, and oh my gosh, we've had to really, really dig pretty deep on it. Stroud did a little bit of work um, and kind of came up with a guideline. Uh, there's some alternatives, BP, uh, or molasses, if you want to use cheese whey or something like that in, in Wisconsin. Uh, so there's there's some alternatives out there, but I think it's something that the discussion needs to start too with the municipality, or there's some alternatives and just give them some guidelines. So that's kind of their approach to But you know, I think what it, and again, I keep coming back to planning, thinking about what's gonna happen. I know a residential backyard is not going to have a ton of salt built up, but I know through experience that these, these commercial areas probably will. So instead of having them say, well, you're planting things that aren't surviving, I'm going to go with the landscaper who's going to fill it up with daylilies, I need to kind of reassess how I'm going about handling this situation and try to plant things that are reactionary to what's happening. And part of that is, you know, picking more salt tolerant species. I think that, you know, you're already, especially in an urban situation, you're already dealing with growing conditions and maintenance issues that just don't exist anywhere else. So it, it's really no surprise that we might have to change our planting strategies. It's, it's 1130. I just want to make sure where we are time-wise. We still have more time for questions. Uh, uh, I think the lunch is in the schedule until 12. Okay. Uh, All right. So we've got. Yeah. Does anybody, uh, we can go back to, pre to, you know, if anybody has any questions about natives or anything like that. I mean, we've got, looks like we got about half an hour here, so we might as well. And yeah, I have a question about the previous slide. Um, I know in Blair County, working with a lot of the Dennis Fours, um, a lot of, Blair has quite a few uh, grass cereal bowls, uh, which is what I like to call them, and a lot of them are owned and maintained by the by the townships. Um, so when they think about retrofitting these things, you know, assuming the the outfall is where it should be, and, and those sorts of things. What I know, there's a few different ways to skin a cat, so to speak. What's what is, what are the the pros and cons, or or other variables? that uh, you consider when deciding how to try to try to convert a uh, turf grass potential base into more of a, a naturalized base? The first thing the first thing that we ask when it comes to any sort of naturalized system, what do you want to see? And what do you want to spend? And what do you want to commit to long term? People might say, well, we just want to, we don't want to spend a lot of money, we just want to convert this because we heard it's a great thing to do. Then usually my reaction is, okay, let's establish a no-mo, stop mowing it, and if you want, we can come back in and we can add some, some wildflower, native wildflowers or something along those lines. 
So they get a naturalized system and they can get some color. And if they decide in a year, you know what, I really don't like this, let's just mow it down. And they can keep managing the turf as turf. If that's kind of that's a good stepping stone for a lot of people that are maybe uncomfortable with the naturalized landscape. Uh, it's kind of like a test. Then the next level would be we want to convert this to a grass meadow. We're open to long-term maintenance. We're open to spending a little bit of money. So if we can come in and the, the basin is dry enough, we can come in, we'll spray it, kill all the existing vegetation, and then we'll seed it. And whether we seed it with a pre-seeder that kind of agitates the soil, or we use a drill seeder that doesn't require any tilling, and the implementation is, is variable, but that would kind of be step two. And then you can build on top of that with, if you can add shrubs and trees, you know, once you see, you can do so. And then the, the last kind of option would be if they say, you know what, we, not only do we want to retrofit it, we want to try to build some, some additional storage into this thing and essentially make a big rain garden. And what you could go in and do is you could scoop out pockets and make these wetland pockets in there add a soil amendment, and then you essentially have these pockets of rain gardens, you can plant those. Um, and obviously as you, as you move up in scale of the project, your homework and background collecting needs to go up. You know, again, if you have a clay layer, you, need, you may not be able to go in and start digging pockets and, and amending the topsoil and, and changing things significantly. You may be trapped in this seeding and planting strategy, or you know, if you can go in and create some wetland pockets, maybe it's an option. But again, it becomes, it, it's what does the client want? What do they want to see? What are they willing to commit to? And how much flexibility do they want? I think the, one of the key problems is that these are your classic detention ponds that have no aesthetic value right now. So adding aesthetics would be great, but converting it to a stormwater management facility where you have more of a bioretention becomes a size scale location to right. open the back of the property to right. put away the route somewhere to it. So what are you losing and gaining? It's sort of your cost benefits to I'm improving some aesthetics, I may get some water quality benefit from just having a better natural vegetation as opposed to just grass. And yeah. but you're losing some volume controls because they're strict they're just volume controls right now. Right. right. And so then you move towards well I really need to keep or increase the volume control and get a water quality benefit, which is you're digging it up, you have to deal with the engineering drawings. What's the soil I mean, what are the how I mean it becomes much more of an engineering and landscape exercise and that's that hop is a huge jump in cost. Yeah. But that's they're not they're not at the stage where they need to they either could do something really below it or they need to move to a higher and it's kind of it's really looking from a uh, and it gets down to it's a volume control right now. They've right. got to maintain that volume. So when you do just vegetation, are you losing some volume? Are you increasing some of the natural infiltration? The, but it's an in and out in terms of yeah. The, the volume issue is one that if you're changing a stormwater facility that was installed because for for regulatory purpose, uh, we always go back. What's the township engineer going to prove? You know because. Some township engineers might say, well, when these trees are, you know, when these bald cypresses are fully mature, that's volume. You're losing volume. Right. They might not allow it. So it, it, in, in terms of how it might affect the function, you really need to go back to whoever the approving agency is and say, is this going to fly? And if they say no, you just redirect. Okay, we're not putting trees in, but they're going to let us put grass in. You know, the, the water quality benefits for a meadow, you know, we kind of touched on, they're, they're, they're much more significant than just turf grass. Not just from aesthetics, but from the, the function they play in infiltrating water, filtering water. You, you have virtually zero root mass in turf grass. Three inch turf probably has, has maybe three inches of really solid root mass, maybe. And as you cut it shorter, and cut it shorter, the roots are going to go up like this because it's responding to the fact that now it's now it's shorter. So um, the 
water the water quality benefits are tangible. A lot of people, a lot of times, you can include. You, you know, your calculations can change a little bit if you're putting a naturalized system in because of. It. But when it comes to affecting function, you know, I'm not going to say start digging pockets in stormwater facilities without reaching out to the right people. Typically, even the municipalities that are involved in the police force, they, um, they're a little nervous about going back and changing the, the integrity of the original stormwater basin. So for Warwick Township, what we did here was, as long as we, we basically kind of excavated some little pockets just to give it a little more um, potential, potential for different varieties of plant material, but um, by excavating out, we were changing the volume of that, of that basin. So they just kind of excavated it out and like, created some higher areas. Um, doesn't show up that well in this picture, but it's ideally it was to create some wet and pockets and some of the woods and that variety. We haven't been asked to do that very often. Yeah, I think we did we did a couple we did like a feasibility study for a watershed group where we looked at basins, retention basins in an established development, and we made a couple recommendations. You know, here are some opportunities to maybe develop some storage entities, but not every one applied. You know, sometimes basins are people's backyards, and that's not you know we can't just the township can't say all right we're just going to go dig up your backyard now it's going to fill up with water. Most people aren't going to be accepting of that. So, not every not every basin is going to be uh, a candidate for creating a little bit of retention. A lot of them are just going to be plan. How do you plan them? You have to look at the drawings and understand how it's built. But I would say nine nine times out of ten, you're going to be in a planting situation. I really think that these retention basins. Uh, are probably the most challenging to establish some type of natural successional landscape because it's really a contrived natural. You know, you know they're, they're dry conditions for drought conditions for like months and then you get three foot of water in them. Well, what, what naturally occurring, you know, plant community is uh, comfortable in that kind of environment is so contrived. So a lot of times we look at them and we try to establish, all right, most of the time they're going to be dry. So we um, try to get as much the cover that we can get in there. So it's typically some kind of meadow or some kind of, some kind of more upland type of, of uh, plant community. And then include some sedges or rushes or some things that will take those wet conditions. They end up settling out in those little pockets that you might have. Um, but you know, they're, I would say they're the most challenging of our projects um, because you don't have that consistent hydrology in such a contrived system. It, it, it's much, it's typically been for us much easier from a retrofit standpoint and from just doing a bioretention basin to, to seed. Because when we put our seed mixes together, I can include upland species, I can include Obligate I can include, you know, so I have so much more, I have more ability to put kind of like a shotgun approach at this thing, and whatever's going to be happy wherever it lands is going to grow. Whereas if you're going to go in and plug it, you better have a pretty good idea of what's happening where before you do so, because, you know, we have a basin right now that has a couple pockets in it that are full of water all the time. and, and uh, Arrow arum is an emergent species up here. It's just there. I, we didn't seed it. It wasn't in seed mix. We didn't plant it. Arrow arum and bulrush just appear in this little puddle of water. And then, like 20 feet away, it's bone dry, and I've got some little blue stem popping. That was a seed mix. And that's like, a perfect example of how things will, if you, if you do your seed mix right and it's install, installed appropriately, uh, you'll get everything dispersed and allow sort of nature to decide what it wants to do. The other challenge with these is, is the planting. And Andy will remember and chuckle because um, when we put this in, it was right after you started, and it was, it was a volunteer planting of the, uh, the herbaceous plugs that went in. 
and you know you have to schedule a volunteer planning ahead of time so like a month ahead it was a saturday morning well there were huge storms right before it they were out in what knee deep water yeah yeah the eagle scout that put it in was my younger brother um <laughs> so we showed up and luckily we specified courts and at that time of year the courts had grown to be about this tall and which was great because the water was like this deep. So we got done planting, you saw these like green plants floating above the water surface. You couldn't see what you're planting. No, I mean in the ideal world you would have the flexibility to be able to do that later or to you know work with it. But they had to have this in. They pushed themselves to the end of their grant and they had to have it installed. They had that gate and all the volunteers were gonna be there. So um, you know, you, you just never know, and it's, it's so much more helpful if you kind of build in that potential um, you know, flexibility there. You know, so did you put those plugs in right with the existing work grass, or did you kill all that off first? It had just been graded. Yeah, so I think what we, yeah, I think what we did is we seeded it, and then the volunteers came out. I think that was how we timed it. And then the thing flooded. I mean, it was a, kind of a miracle. It looks the way it does because it just flooded out. Can you right put, can you can you plant um, cords or or plugs in with the turf grass and <coughs> it'll take over? It's because you know as soon as you rip up all that turf grass, and you have the ENS concern potentially. Yeah, what we have planting in the turf turf grass is not my favorite strategy, but it is a strategy you. Because cool season grasses like turf grass, they're just really aggressive by nature and they create these dense mats. That's why they're effective as turf grass, because they do create those dense mats. So what tends to happen is that I've seen it will if we if we plant right into turf grass, it'll kind of draw moisture from the plug. And unless you keep those plugs high um, watered, they dry out. Uh, the strategy we've used with varying success is creating these big patches that we're going to plant and we kill it off and we do like one herbicide application to the point where it gets brown but not it doesn't die it kind of gets that yellow texture color to it and then we plant it and the hope is you know we're kind of stunting the turf grass put the quartz in and, and hopefully they take off Again, we've had kind of varying success with that. A lot of times what we see, I've seen happen is the herbaceous material that we planted will die back that first year and then it'll re-push the following spring. Sedges, sedges are like notorious for doing that. We'll plant sedges and I'll, we'll go to a site and they're all dead and come back the following year and they're like two feet tall. So, it's tough. You can do it. You could also you could also scalp it. You know, take a string trimmer or a mower or something and come in and really cut sections down really uh, close to the ground. And, and if it, if it's not grass that's typically scalped, it should re-sprout. The root system's still there. So if you hit it really hard, it'll it'll probably re-sprout sprout kind of patchy. But it's, you knocked it back enough that you reduce competition a little bit. Just seeding with a girl in, a seed girl. Depends. Depends on what access is like. Um, we have a couple of detention basins that I could go in any time of year with our tractor and drill, and we could seed them. We have a couple others that I don't even know if I go in there with a small kind of like walk behind a three seeder. But the good news is, you know, if there is a little bit of moisture, you can seed it as long as you can get soil contact with the seed to the soil. Uh, the water will kind of help draw it down into the soil a little bit, so there are benefits there. Um, it's a timing thing. <coughs> you have to think about timing a lot. Winter, you know, if you could, if you have a drill seed and that's your only method for doing it, maybe you consider a dormant seeding, do it in the winter when the ground's a little bit frozen and a little firmer. Um, or if you can get in there with a pre-seeder. We're doing a wetland meadow tomorrow down in Lancaster and it's dry enough that we'll take a tractor in with a pre-seeder, agitate the ground a little bit, seed it, and we'll roll it. We have a, a roller we fill with water, and that just kind of pushes the seed into the ground a little bit better. So it's, it's uh, case by case with these kinds of things, because you can't, 
can't say next Wednesday it's going to be dry enough down in that detention basin because you just don't know. 